Hi everybody and um, welcome to this week's ISC webinar. Um, today I'm joined by a number of panelists that, that we'll introduce you to, to shortly. Uh, my name is Steve Ashwood, I'm Chief Executive of the ISC and today we're going to be talking about talent pooling and why it is crucial to the new normal in early talent. Um, a little bit of an uh, insight into how our webinars work if you haven't been on one before. The um, we have you all on mute because our, our audience is a, a, there's quite a lot of you actually on the webinar. So, um, so rather than have everybody talk over each other, please use the questions dialog box to ask questions. So we, we really do encourage you to ask those questions. So, um, as we go through the webinar, questions pop into your head. If you can um, put those into the dialog box, what I will do is play those um, back to to the panelists at, towards the end of end of the session. Um, a little request from me because I am trying to do sort of do two or three things at once. Um, so if you can keep those questions relatively short rather than putting in sort of um, big long paragraphs, because actually as I'm kind of um, asking questions and looking at my screen, um, I'm really, really, really very good at doing one thing at once. So, so I would very much appreciate that. Um, anyway, that's enough from me. What I'm going to do now is hand over to Will from um, my kind of future. Will will introduce himself and the rest of your panellists. Will, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. And thanks everyone for giving up a bit of your lunchtime today or your daily stroll around the block or whatever you tend to do on a lunchtime. I think this is probably um, a good point for me to see if my tech works and share onto my screen, which seems to have done. Uh, fantastic. Um, so yeah, look, big, big thank you for, um, for everyone for dialing in. We are talking about what is really a very timely and very topical um, area today, talent pooling, which essentially, if you haven't come across the term before, is all about getting better impact um, and outcomes from the digital events that you are running or planning to run with uh, young people in, in the year ahead. Um, we've got a fantastic pool of expert panellists today to, to take you through um, uh, the young persons and the educators' insights to that. Just before I hand over to our panellists, I'm just going to give a quick snapshot into who my kind of future are just for a bit of context for you who is speaking uh, to you today um, we are the UK's largest underrepresented talent specialists so very simply our mission is to level the playing field when it comes to entering the world of work for young people uh, in school leave positions or undergraduate positions um, but particularly those who face hidden barriers be it because of geography because of gender because of race or socioeconomic status um, and in that way, we support our employer partners. We work with employers in pretty much every single sector to better target diverse talent through our school, college and university networks and to better support and engage candidates through their recruitment process and into day one and beyond uh, through really smart uh, digital. Now, we've got a really packed agenda today and a, and a, and a, and a lot to get through in, in the time we've got, which is fantastic and, and, and a really great uh, lineup of panellists. And just before I introduce the panellists to you or before they introduce themselves, just a bit of context on what we hope you get out of today's session. Um, it's really an opportunity for everyone on the uh, call to hear from experts who are living the reality on the ground in terms of what schools are facing and, and young people at uh, university level. Um, so we really hope that you come away with a real understanding of how best to engage and work with both educators and young people in the months ahead uh, through the engagements that you will be running. Um, and the conversation that our panellists will be having uh, will be supplemented by a report or a survey that we pushed out to our education partners, but also to our young people networks and our educator networks um, about the main concerns that um, they will have about the year ahead to try and match those up and see how we can best work together when it comes to employers, uh, young people and educators. So that's a bit of a summary. Um, now, if I hand over to our wonderful panellists, um, Steph, maybe if I can come to you first, please, for a brief instruction to yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Will. Um, hi, everyone. Great to be here. Um, I'm Steph. I'm Head of Early Careers at My Kind of Future. Um, today, I'll very much be talking from sort of secondary school careers education point of view. Um, at My Kind of Future, um, myself and my team lead on all of the campaigns and activity we do that engages young people, inspiration or attraction uh, in their early careers. Thanks, Steph. And uh, Sam and Andrew, over to you. Um, I'm Sam. I'm a final year student at the University of Strathclyde. I'm also the president of the Strathclyde Bright Future Society, and I'll be a graduate 
in a year's time. So I'll be bringing forward that different student graduate perspective. Uh, hi, I'm, I'm Andrew Wright. I'm Head of Employer Engagement at King's College London. Um, so I look after a team of around 20 individuals who are, are employer relations specialists. Um, so we work with employers based in the UK and globally as well. Together with all of our events, um, our internships, both within the curriculum and uh, extracurricular. And uh, I also look after some of our evolving uh, year in industry or placement provision across the institution as well. Thanks, Andrew. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Khadija, so I'm the Senior University Partnership Manager at My Kind of Future. I sit within the Early Careers team and staff, um, and I lead on all of our university attraction and our connections with career services and student societies. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. So, yeah, a really broad range um, of expertise, both from the school leaver perspective and the school perspective, right the way through to uh, the, 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 the graduate world. And um, so we're going to jump into a conversation just in a moment um, between the panellists on some key questions that came up and key concerns that came up from employers um, following the survey that, that, that we put out uh, a, a couple of weeks ago. And um, just before we get into that conversation, we're just going to take a quick step back. Um, to understand the current landscape and how employers are reacting to, to the turmoil that we see at the moment. Um, now, these are just some, some very top line stats from some fantastic research and data that the IC captured, and it's, 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 it's all on their website. So um, there's, you, can, you can do a much deeper dive into it than, than what we've got here. But, but just as a bit of a, um, a bit of top line context, what is evident and what is shining through is that hiring numbers are going to be subdued um, in, in, in the autumn term, particularly for school leaver roles. Um, now, it might be, and if we look at recessions that have uh, come before, that actually as confidence in the economy grows, num hiring numbers will start to pick up again. But certainly, as we move into the new academic year, we expect numbers uh, uh, to, 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 to be lower. And of course, that's industry specific, that's industry specific as well. And um, from a perspective of engaging young people, of course, most activities are, of course, going to have to go digital um, and, you know, very close to our heart as an organisation that will, it could well impact the diversity of talent that is being brought into businesses. You know, we typically see work experience type events or face to face activities between employees and the young person as the best opportunity for disadvantaged young people to um, gain insights into a sector, to demystify roles um, and to support them and to upskill them in the competencies that are required to be successful as they move from the world of education into the world of work. So definitely concerns as well about um, about how diversity and students from underrepresented backgrounds will, 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 will be hitting in the months ahead. So that's a bit of top line context, just very briefly as well, a snapshot into um, the findings of uh, our own research uh, that, that, that we put out to, to our network and, and that will help supplement the conversation you're about to hear. Um, what shone through really, really strongly from employers was we know we're going to have to engage digitally rather than face to face. But we're unsure how best to do it. And I think a very practical example of that was some, something that was actually mentioned to me on a, or, or during a call a couple of days ago with an employer that said, look, when we get young people into a room, we're actually quite good at engaging with them and it's quite difficult for them to leave. Um, but actually, when we're doing that digitally, it's very easy for a young person to switch their camera off, to stop engaging or to, to walk away from their computer. So what are the types of digital engagements which are best going to best resonate with young people um, and actually set us, set, separate us apart from competition? From an educator's perspective, what's shone through is that employers are going to have to do more to come across as human, so not purely rely on the strength of their brand alone uh, when it comes to engaging talent. So thinking about how you can support young people to understand you as a business and the types of people and the types of roles that, 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 that you have. Um, and that's all the more pressing when we look at how young people are reacting to COVID-19 and, and for pretty much everyone or everyone we surveyed, they said it's, it's massively influencing their perception of industry um, and the choices that they are likely to make over the coming months. So how you present yourself as an employer and as a brand to young people um, is, is, is going to be more important than ever in the months ahead. So there's a bit of top line summary. Um, now I'm uh, going to hand over to our panellists with some of the key questions that employers had 
um, about how to navigate the months ahead to hopefully give you some context of, 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 of how education is reacting and, and how to best support young people. Um, and the first question I think is a really good starting point. Um, and Steph, maybe if I can come to you first from a school's perspective, what do you see as being the main concerns that young people are going to be facing when it comes to the, 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 the next academic year? Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think although um, I'll definitely be talking from a secondary school perspective, I think this could be quite applicable for all sort of young people in education or coming out of education. Um, so one of those, the really big pieces is around qualifications and grades. Um, so there's still some some uncertainty um, for, for school leavers um, and for A-level students around um, how exactly they're going, uh, how that's going to happen. Um, but also just some confusion as well um, for employers you know should they um, perhaps look at flexing some of the grade criteria that they have for certain roles or certain programs because of the context and because of what's happening so I think there's definitely questions around that um, there's this uh, you know we hear a lot about a, a lack of opportunities that we're seeing in the school leaver apprentice um, market and um, really worrying but you know equally as worrying is that apparent lack of, of opportunities you know there's quite a negative um, discourse at the minute around um, you know young people entering the world of work or taking their next steps in their educational career and um, it's you know you're, it's filled with ideas of there's, there's going to be you know high unemployment there's not going be enough opportunities and and that can actually be really damaging for, for young people even just that idea that, that that of that negativity um you know for for us at my kind of future and and for the career leaders in these secondary schools that we work with um one of the really big questions we're asking ourselves is can and how can we meet those Gatsby benchmarks digitally is it possible um to, to do that without face-to-face -face activity um we're not sure when we're going to have that face-to-face -face activity back in schools um certainly doesn't look like it will happen in autumn terms so really looking at how we can offer support um, so that we we ensure those schools meet those Gatsby benchmarks digitally um, and and just a big question really uh, as I said about when can we go back to face to face and, and what will it look like and we're trying to be as innovative as possible um, to ensure that those young people still get those engagements um, without sort of the mass face to face that that we saw previously. And Andrew does that resonate from uh, what you're seeing in the university landscape? I think a lot of it does actually um, and, and Steph talked about the sort of qualifications piece in the school area and that was certainly one of the initial challenges that we had um, and engaging with employers and with students sort of you know how are their you know qualifications going to be seen right now is it going to be looked at differently um, the ways that they're being assessed and examined are different and therefore how are employers going to interpret some of that um, I know my kind of future in ISE did some great work in trying to, to pull some of that together to help us as well but I think the biggest kind of concern that we're still seeing is, is this inevitable uncertainty? You know, th this is completely overwhelming. It's all those words we could throw out about new normals and everything else. We've had recessions and we've had challenges like we face right now before, but never quite in a world that is so digital. You know, usually there's been other ways to move sort of um, things towards. And actually now we're only faced with digital really as, as the solution. So I think for students, what we're seeing is a lot of challenges around Headlines, obviously, they're seeing in the press, and I think diving beneath those is something we're really kind of stressing to students to see the difference between what is the wider economy and perhaps the differences in sectors across the graduate labour market, which is often actually holding up. Um, and we're seeing a lot of that in the ISC data too. But things around start dates, you know, being delayed. What does that mean for for visas and things? What do, what does it mean to be in a different time zone, perhaps, over the next few months if you're studying remotely? And how do we make sure that all of our support and our teaching is accessible to those students and accessible to those employers as well, so that all of those kind of components come together. I think digital overload is going to be the big challenge that we all face. You know, we're in a world where we're living both, you know, our teaching and our careers education and our engagement with employers and all of our personal lives completely by sort of apps and phones and everything else. I think it's overwhelming. You know, I think we're all finding that. Um, and so this sort of overwhelming sense of finding the right windows in the calendar, I think is going to be a real challenge and the right platforms to do that as well. Um, and, you know, we're using kind of webinar platforms today. I think we're all struggling to work out 
still how to how to maintain some of the activities that students and employers want within the right online sort of robust systems that also continue to offer um, and highlight things like diversity and inclusion as such a critical area so we don't undo a lot of that good work by moving everything online um, so those are the few things I'd, I'd sort of flag for now And Sam, from, from what about from your perspective as as as, as a student? Um, I definitely agree with everything that Andrew said. But on top of that, some of the main things are trying to build relationships with those future employers in the digital world. That's obviously a lot more difficult because we don't have access to those careers fairs and events in university or outside of university. And also trying to gain experience, whether that be just work experience, industry placements, internships, things like that. Because obviously there's a big rise in virtual or online internships, but do employers recognise them on your CV in the same way that traditional mm -hmm. internships would be recognised? That's a key concern. And just trying to get tangible experience that employers are going to want to recognise and they're going to appreciate and then employ and then employers, that's a massive concern for people. And then trying to build relationships. That's really the main thing I'd say. Perfect. I think I would, you know, pull upon what both Andrew and Sam have kind of touched upon. There are two routes that I would say students are concerned and worried about. One of them is that what is that job market going to look like? Is competition going to increase because there are going to be less places? Now, I know UCAS have released some data where university application numbers have actually gone up, um, which I think was a surprise to most people. But that adds to that element of competition and, and what is going to be available. And then the second one is the loss of academic opportunities, things like our placement years changing, they've not had internships, I might not be able to do my semester abroad, which teaches young people a lot of skills that they then use to put on their CVs and then connect with employers. So I think there are kind of two different areas that students are really concerned about. And from an employer's perspective, it's just, keeping those communication lines open and the different opportunities, so not just webinars, but actually we can have digital mentoring or kind of modular learning. So it sits and suits different learning needs. That's that's that, that's really interesting. And actually, when and, and, and that's a really nice lead into um, the next question, which is about how employers can best engage um, with education and, and, and directly with students in, in, in a new digital world um, and, and you're absolutely right we are going they are going to need different ways to do it rather than purely relying on webinars um, Steph I might come to you again first of all from, from a school's perspective and anything that you've seen that's really working or that you expect to uh, particularly help in, in the months ahead yeah absolutely I mean this is the question we've been asking ourselves uh within within our teams at my kind of future for for the last three four months and 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 I think you know the the first thing to say is that we have um pivoted all of our activity um early careers activity to virtual or digital events um so importantly whereas before we we were unsure whether it could work or would work um we know now that it, it really can be done and it can um still be be as impactful um, but really um, the best way to answer this question is is to understand the outcome that's wanted from the activity so um, the tool to engage will will depend on whether the activity is to do with pipelining whether it's purely in, inspiration whether it's a CSR activity um, so it's it's difficult to answer without knowing sort of the you know what the organization is trying to achieve and and what those objectives are because it really would depend um but some of the things that that we really need to have within those um offers in in a digital world is to keep that direct input from employer to student and make that as interactive as possible uh, when you can um and really get, giving that young person some real insight into into the world of work be that in in the office space that, that you used to occupy and and maybe we'll do in the future or the home working space which might be um, our no new normal and having a great platform from which to launch any of that activity is kind of the, the foundation of, of doing um, this well in a digital world um, and just importantly that we, we can't let 
this context stop us from engaging with young people um, and there's so many different ways we can we can do that um, and, and as I said that depends on the outcome that you want but but there's all there will always be a way to do it digitally Sam I'll, I'll, Sam, I'll pick on you next. I thought, I thought you were about to come in. What, what have you seen that works well or, or how should employers best engage with, with, with you on the ground? I think one of the best ways to engage currently before that all this happened was the one-to-one -one discussions that you had at those careers fair and events or through email with employers or senior people. And that needs to essentially be replicated in a digital world. So there should be functionalities where we can have webinars, but there should be breakout sessions with smaller groups so we can have discussions with each other as students, but with a central person within a graduate employer who we can actually learn from, get inspired by, ask for advice, get tips about jobs, hear stories of what's happening in organisations. That's the key thing that us as graduates want to hear because it's then going to make us want to work for those organisations, but also having the ability to have continual communication with employers whether that be through email or mentoring through one-to-one -one Zoom calls, things like that, for even five minutes. It's those one-to-one -one discussions that can really change whether a graduate is going to want to try and apply for an, um, an employer or whether they won't. It's those sort of in-depth, unique conversations that people have, people can have that are really, really important. And I've definitely seen that in like, practice so far with, um, with organisations in uni. When they do have those one-to-one -one conversations in the offline world, they work for the, for the employer and the graduate. So if we can replicate that in the, in the digital world, that's going to be really, really important. Yeah, and I can't, I, you know, I I do agree with that, but I think there's a a bigger piece of this digital fatigue that Andrew kind of alluded to at the start and thinking about the different ways that you can engage and utilizing people like Sam and presidents of societies and brand ambassadors who there is going to be some element of of face to face that they can do that you might not be able to do as an employer so having that blend of digital and face to face where possible and, and utilizing those the students on the ground the career services on the ground that can have in smaller groups and kind of promote your message so that the students feel like they're getting some form of a a one to one or a, a one to three or four and kind of that small groups I think will really help as well. I think Steph's point is really really key in in this as well, which is you know the answer to this question is reliant on what are you trying to get out, what who are you trying to reach, what are you trying to communicate, you know, is this about your brand and recruitment, is this about one to one. You know, and I think that that fundamentally is the answer. I know universities like schools um, and, and organisations like my kind of future you know, up and down the country are really trying to grapple with this question and kind of strip back everything they usually do to think, why do we do this? What's what's the purpose of this? What is going to be the benefit to this in a digital world? Can we replicate some of those benefits in the same way? And I think often the answer we're finding is either no or that this has got a slightly different sort of take on it now. So certainly from a king's perspective you know we we've we've gone all out and basically stripped the entire of our autumn pro program back and rebooted it completely again and we've come up with sort of new ways of delivering which we hope will start to replicate some of the things sam talked about in terms of those one-to-ones that means that it's flexible and it's kind of a combination of small activities with larger activities that is scheduled around sort of the students different timetables so they don't become kind of overloaded by having things blocked into their schedule um, and, we're, and we're extending the length by which we're undertaking a lot of those events as well so rather than have it in a kind of synchronous session over an hour or two hours actually you know we're extending the window for a whole week and you can drop in and out of different activities throughout that period but I think there's also of course a whole range of other things that employers um, can do to interact with students so we're talking a lot about kind of events and career fairs and things but there's a lot of work going into, as Sam talked about, sort of targeted messaging. You know, how can you find profiles of students and reach out to them? How can you use social media as well as a tool that all of us are going to be um, looking at? And I'm sure many employers are going to be using that much more regularly. Those things are only going to ever reach certain segments of the population. Um, and so I think there is a, a need to kind of go back, as, as Steph said, to think about who are we reaching here? What do we want to do? But certainly there's a lot of work going into trying to answer that question. 
that, that's that's really really helpful con, uh, context from you all. Um, and and Andrew, I'll, I might come back to you uh, first on this point. Um, uh, I think this is a bit. This question is a bit of a deeper dive in within the digital engagements that employers will need to be running. What key features separate those that do work? And frankly, those that are less likely to resonate. And, and just I'm conscious of time to make sure we have uh, time for good questions at the end. Can we just one or two key points from you all, please, on, on this? Sure. I, I think having those different formats. So is it educational? Is it recruitment kind of focused? Careful planning around that content as well. I think we've all got so much content that we could put out actually what's the right stuff to put out and how do you curate that in the right way so that students can navigate it as easily as possible um, and sort of chunking things down into kind of smaller bite-sized areas that work flexibly are, are kind of the things that we're looking at together with not being afraid to build on that I kind of start from one base but build up towards it return on investment is going to look very different I think over the coming months for, for all parties and I think acknowledging that's going to be really key um, one thing I would say in terms of content is that it really needs to be relatable now. So content on your social media and your emails on your website is obviously key to engaging us. So videos and stories from recent graduates who have entered your organisation, that's massive to engage in us as graduates because we want to see what it's like to work there, what projects they might have been working on in their first year or two or a couple of months. Um, being proactive and getting that content out so whether it's being proactive and emailing us about possible opportunities in the future just engaging to show that you are care about us as graduates is really important yeah um, um, for me, sorry Khadija you go you go okay, next. Okay, without kind of repeating what's already been said I think it's quite important to remember that things are going to be needed to be recorded and students are going to be able to access them at any time. And even, even if you think about today in this webinar that we're doing, like there are going to be people that haven't been able to come on and will want to listen to us at, at a different time. And although employers might lose the traditional walk-ins that you get from face-to-face -face events, it's going to be built up on those that come on at a time that suits them to listen. So it's thinking about making the, the events that you do run and the content that you do put out to be accessible at any time. Um, and 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 just for me, uh, I'll try and be quite short. But um, for for schools, it's just really important that whatever digital alternatives are offered, that they're still meeting those Gatsby benchmarks. And there has been quite a lot of guidelines, especially from the CEC, around what your digital alternative needs to include if it's going to hit benchmark five, benchmark six. Um, so, it, for example, um, to still include digital activity. Um, under benchmark five, it has to include two-way interaction between the student and the employer, um, and there has to be evidence that the student actively participated. So, upskilling your, upskilling yourself as as an organisation in what schools need to do to meet those benchmarks will enable uh, that offer to be taken up better um, and basically be more successful with that school. Thanks, everyone. And I, yeah, I, re I really like all those points, particularly the point, Sam, on the power of peer-to-peer -peer insight um, and, and, and how valuable that will be. Um, our, 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 our last question before we move on to Q&A, so please, um, a quick reminder, if you've got questions for the panel, please um, please do put them through. Um, I'm going to ask you all for your one top tip, please, on um, how employers can stand out from the crowd um, in, the, in the months ahead. And Steph, I'll come back to you first. Sure. So mine's really my top tip is really simple and is engage now. Um, I think some some organisations are kind of waiting and seeing what the landscape's going to look like. But those organisations that that engage in a deep way with students now, when when it's difficult, they'll be the ones that young people and schools will remember. Andrew. Um, I think engage with universities and societies, be led by what works and what they're what they're delivering. Um, more than ever, I think you need to understand what works on certain campuses and with certain student societies than others. Um, and be bold. If, if there's ever a time to do something differently, this is it. Um, mine would be kind of, I guess, the, the reason of this webinar is, is building your, your talent pool, keeping them warm, um, and 
just having different things on offer and having a good blended approach? Mines would, mines would be have be relatable and be honest and be transparent in all your communications. Great, thank you so much, everyone. And, and, and some key themes coming through here on the importance of in, engaging now and thinking about how you keep talent engaged, which I think really links into this um, talent pooling theme, which I'll touch upon in just a minute. And um, before we do that, I think most important is to give you all the time to ask the questions you've got from your panel. So, uh, Stephen, over to you if we've, we've had anything come through. Uh, you have, yes, got a few questions through all, already. So um, the first question I've got is, what are the key topics of interest that will attract young people to events? I think this is asking about specific um, topics that, 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 that students will want to hear about. I can come in on that one first, if that's all right. Um, I, I think number one is going to be, what am I going to learn and get out of this? You know, I, th I think that's an obvious one, but also one of the things we're asking employers and I expect students will want to hear is what's changed within that business as a result of COVID-19. You know, what, what are the kind of themes around that that helped me, as Sam was alluding to, think about what my role in future is going to be versus someone who did it two years ago. What's your business actually learned from this? How has it helped the community? How has it helped change its kind of um, direction possibly? Um, and how is an un, you know a graduate going to exist in that business in the future? And I, I think in addition, um, what what I'm hearing is that young people want to hear about the recruitment process that hasn't changed, um, but also about the recruitment practices that may have changed or not changed. What are the plans for the organisation in autumn term? Um, are they still going to recruit? apprentices are they still going to recruit grads I think that that's really important as well um, and and in for the inspiration piece rather than the attraction piece um, they want to see content um, that's aligned with the curriculum to add into what's just been said they are I would say at events the still the ability to network and really what you have both just said the ability to gain real insights about what is actually going on in organizations from people who are actually doing stuff in organisations is really important. And I think to add to that, it's also what else has been happening. So the, the Black Lives Matter, how have employers responded to that? With it being Pride Month, the last month, you know, how have employers responded? The, the green strategy and environmental factors, and they're all still really important. And I think it's, you know, don't forget that and just focus on this is what we've done for COVID. There are other factors that young people are still very passionate about. Well, that's great. Thanks for those insights. So um, the next question I've got is from an employer that's got a recruitment freeze, um, but they're, they're looking at hiring later in the year. We've heard this from employers that there's so much uncertainty that actually they, they, they might be recruiting at the moment, might be doing it later in the year or actually they might be recruiting gradually, i.e. release some vacancies um, in the early part of the autumn and just see how, how business trades to see if they go anymore. But the question is around actually that that engaging with, with, with students, even when you may not have actual vacancies and hiring to do. So it should employers still engage when they haven't got any vacancies and what might they do to remain, to still remain visible as, a, as an employer? Um, um, yeah, I'm, oh, sorry, Sam, go ahead. Yeah, all right. One of the things I'd say is very much on what was just said is email and put out on your social media about things that your organisation is doing, like Black, Black Lives Matter, like Pride Month, things that are relatable, things that students and graduates are actually interested in. So they will, look, we will therefore engage with those kind of things. So we're going to, that's going to show that you're going to value the people that are wanting to work in your organisation. So engage with us through those kind of things, but also just engage with us through things that we said before about continuous communication, about what your organisation is currently doing apart from COVID, that will get the interest from us and if the vacancies arise then we will want to and we will be interested in working in your organisation. Um, I was just going to say that being transparent about that and, and kind of relaying some of those plans as much as possible to their potential call of young people who might join them in the future um, and really it goes back to that question what what is the objective of the activity in this case it's not to pipeline or recruit 
directly right now but actually maybe it's about brand awareness and and increasing their brand awareness in young people for you know a year's time or two years time so if you're looking at schools maybe we suggest you go to year 12 rather than year 13 and then we do activity um around increasing brand awareness and engaging with young people which is more inspiration and that's things like online challenges online competitions um which means you don't have to have roles that need to be filled now it's about inspiration um and in showing that you want to engage and support young people in schools um during this time even if you don't have those vacancies for them to go into straight away and i think that's the same for the university space as well um the freshers that are about to come in the first year students you know they've still got three four years at university and and hopefully things have picked up by then but what are you going to do for those students to show that you're still interested in them i was talking to a student earlier today and, and one of the things that she brought up was that when she was in the first year it just felt like employers weren't focusing on her but now that she's at a place where she's looking for jobs and graduating she doesn't really know where to look as much because it's it's always kind of right at the end and I think what COVID has done, and if you do have a, a recruitment freeze, is, is that brand awareness piece with the younger years. So when they do come to apply, they're going to have a consistent message throughout. I think I'd, I'd agree with Khadija there. Um, you know, there's lots of practical things employers can do, blogs, competitions, et cetera, that you can always push out and reach an audience if you're not sort of recruiting. Together, we're kind of looking at years of study. I think a lot of universities now are working to kind of with a lot of data to kind of think about where students are in their career thinking and a lot of employer focus is often on those students who are right at the kind of stage whereby you know they're ready they're warm they know what they want to do actually thinking about well how can i engage with those students who are still discovering the options how as an employer can I help them along the way whether they're a first year or even a kind of second or, or final year still there's a different way of looking at your campaign there um, and thinking about how can, how can I really engage with those cohorts that will spread the word um, rather than just focus on those students kind of in that action phase, ready to go and ready to be recruited. Uh, great. Um, another question here that's come um, from Sam. So Sam's asking actually outside of programme content, um, what else is important to young people when choosing an employer? And I think you touched on this with some of the, the diversity responses, but I wonder if there's uh, there's anybody else um, that, that that any other aspects you think that employers should should be focusing on when talking to students? Um, one of the trying to engage with us, I would say one of the really important things is not just trying to be relatable. That is really important in gaining our attention, but it is working with the co working with like coordinators in our in our universities trying to link up with our course whether that be through talking at the start of maybe an online lecture or coming into a lecture in uni or talking to a small group in a tutorial or trying to link up with a project in uni there is one company um, um, that's worked with us in first and second year of university they also came into my school in my last year of school and I would say they're probably the most attractive employer in Glasgow to graduates because they've always linked up with us and that's four years of education now they've always linked up with us so linking up with subjects that relate to your organization and universities is absolutely key but it could be a short video posted at the start of a lecture online or it could be coming into the tutorial that's happening in university it's like there's many options but linking up with the subject is key Um, just move on to another question here. This is the Ryan digital divide and touches on the di diversity question. So um, one of the questions around digital divide um, and is digital transformation becomes you know, even more important as a result of coronavirus. We have much more stuff being virtually. Of course, there are issues about um, disadvantaged groups being able to access whether it's online engagement tools, whether they've got the technology, whether they've got um, you know, the Wi-Fi capability or even just the space to actually um, you know, engage online, um, you know, really busy households with, with, with no private space. So has anybody got any thoughts on what on what um, what we should all be doing actually to try and to try and bridge that digital divide and make sure it doesn't doesn't get any worse? I, 
I've, I've seen a few interesting um, kind of specific case studies recently when it, when it comes to the recruitment piece itself of employers. And again, Sam's touched upon this, that transparency, sort of acknowledging that up front and saying to candidates, don't worry if, you know, someone bursts in a room. Don't worry if your internet connection goes down or whatever. We understand these challenges and actually, you know, putting those candidates at ease if, if you're through to that stage or being very open in some of the activities and events you're doing as well, which is say, we know you're probably juggling this. That's fine. If you need to dip out for five minutes, dip back in, that's OK. I think we all have to be quite transparent and upfront about those things and those employers that are really showcasing that in some of the communications they're sending out that I'm seeing to candidates. I think those candidates are really appreciating that sense that there's an understanding of the challenges they face and it's not going to disadvantage them in any particular way. Yeah, I mean, there's a great question uh, that 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 answer as well was it was exactly what I was thinking, and I don't think there is one answer to 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 solve that problem. It's definitely a fundamental problem of of a lot of activity going digital. Um, one of the things we are doing is for certain activities like digital work experience, we do offer it in a, a paper based version obviously it's a different experience but it is available for those who wouldn't be able to have continuous access to the internet um, but also in creating that that digital work experience we try to be as mindful as possible so we're not you know we don't require the young person to be on the internet um, and take their bandwidth up from sort of nine till four they log in maybe for an hour they get their tasks and then they can go offline so there's a lot of offline working to try and even it out somewhat um, and, and I guess the flip side of that is that the huge benefit of going digital is actually that we can access some of those remote areas um, that, that would otherwise not have got that employee engagement if it was face to face. So th there's definitely an issue there that needs to be solved, um, but some benefits as well, I think. And I think just to add to that is this is where you need to work with the educators and the career services. They know their students, they all have been talking to their students over the summer, you know, from when COVID hit and they kind of know what's happening. They're a good way to reach students and it's thinking about going to them direct through their means, but also the people that are helping them as well. Um, anything you'd add to that, Sam, from a student perspective? Um, that's a difficult question. I I don't know. I, I agree with what could you what could they just said of really working with universities and using them as a bridge to students. I think that really is the key way to do it, working with educators, even working with people like me in societies as a bridge to other students is really, really important. Um and engaging students. I think that I think that is the key way to do it. And um, I've also had a question through specifically for you, Sam, and that's about communication, because you talked about this continuous communication, particularly through your whole education journey. But um, this, and I hear this question asked a lot by employers, and that's kind of, it's what channels work? You know, what channels do you like a multiple range of channels that you use? You know, do you like Twitter or LinkedIn, or is it different for every student? Is it, you know, I know <laughs> getting you to speak for the entire student body is a bit unfair, but, but I guess what, what works for you would be good to know, or what you think works for your your peer group as well? I think it really it really depends on what subjects and what your organisation is, but you've really got to work across all of your social media channels. So you've got to be engaging with students on Facebook, you've got to be on LinkedIn as well, you've got to be on Twitter, and you've got to encourage students to sign up on your website and constantly email them. That's the thing that I've talked about with constant communication is really important. By constantly emailing them, it's keeping like the idea that the organisation cares about students, even if you're not recruiting right now, it will keep us engaged with you if you're going to email us, if you're putting up videos on your LinkedIn. So really definitely LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook and email is so important to engage us as your channels. Andrew, from a university perspective, would you, would you agree with what Sam said? I, I think so. I mean, I think I think we have the same challenge as universities, which is, you know, what, what are the right platforms to engage with our own students? And, and each year that's different and each cohort and faculty that's completely different too. So we're using that same approach or those challenges as well the employers face, which is we have to be everywhere. 
um, and try and make what we do sort of structurally unavoidable. I, I think, you know, that ability for employers to kind of follow up and, and so that there is a kind of not just passive communication, but actually kind of active communication. So it's not just kind of posting stuff out and then expecting it to be read, but actually the responses and interacting, I think, is really, really key as well. Um, so as Sam said, not just, you know, putting something on LinkedIn, expecting them to read it, but actually replying and engaging and trying to create that conversation too. And um, so I've also had a question here about um, post events. So what's the best way to keep talent engaged after um, an event, once you've interacted with, with students through that event? So it's not just about the event, it's the, it's the, it's the follow up afterwards. And what's the best way to do that? Does anybody have any thoughts on that? I think the idea of honesty and transparency is really, really important. So there's got to be really an idea behind the event. Why was it happening? Was it about informing students? Was it about inspiring students? Um, was it about job opportunities that are coming up? If it was about the idea of like networking, then it needs to be followed up with communications through your email, through your social media, about how we can then um, apply for these jobs. It's all about providing more information and engaging with us continually or giving us a route to get into that job um, or just continuing with the inspiration about how good that employer is. It's got to have a continual flow of communication afterwards and it's got to be two way, as we've said. I think it's it keep, feeds into that kind of keep warm strategy. If you think about when an employer has recruited someone and you have this pre-boarding days before they land on the desk at, at kind of day one. It's the same post event and it's having and releasing different content or videos and things that link to that event and drip feeding it. And it's keeping that talent engaged so that when the roles are available, they're kind of set and ready to apply. It's offering tips on how to get through the application process or giving them something that they can kind of go offline and work on and then potentially come back and engage through social media, digital mentoring and different platforms so that they have the ability to ask these questions. And it's almost like a, you've met us, you've seen us at the event, maybe you're shy and you didn't want to ask a question. So here's another opportunity to do that. And just allowing the students the different mediums and methods and opportunities to continuously engage. I think it's I think from it's it's a really good question. Um and it's you know, we, we must remember that the digital events that we're running themselves aren't the output. The output is what happens off the back of it. And students, I think, from experience are unlikely to change their perception of an industry or career off the base of a one-off engagement. So Sam was talking earlier about the importance of multiple touch points and following up with relevant content. Tech means we can do that or we can automate all of that. And, and um, I've actually got a, a screen up now and, and we'll, we'll share the report um, with attendees into some really cool ways of, of, of following up with students digitally and providing them with the information they need, as well as things like how to best target um, in, in, the month, in the months ahead. So I'm just, I'm just very conscious of time, Stephen, and please, if there are more questions, let's follow them. But if you do want, um, if you do want those insights, please do, um, or do want those brochures, please do get in touch to any of us um, off the off the back of this webinar, um, and, we'll, and we'll and we'll send those across. And there's loads of great ideas into there in terms of digital engagements and and the full report from from the survey we've talked about. Stephen, sorry to butt in. There, there might be other questions. No, that's fine. Probably, yeah, I was just about to say um, we're, we're we're done on the questions. I think now now will. Was there anything that you wanted to say to to to, to wrap us up before I kind of conclude everything? Mm -hmm. No, thank you. No, just look, th thank, thanks everyone for, for your time on the call today. Massive thanks to the panelists. It's a really big topic. Um, and I, I hope we I hope we've um broken down some of those mis 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 misconceptions and, we, and we've given some really useful insights or, or the panelists have to the reality on the ground. As I said, all that survey that um supported the conversation today, we will be putting that into a brochure with the full findings as well as hints and tips on navigating the months ahead. So that please do get in touch with any one of us um, and, and, and we'll send that across uh, to you. Uh, my email's on there, so uh, as well as uh, if you've got any more direct questions to, to the panellists, which you didn't get the opportunity to ask today. So really just a big thank you for, for, for your time and listening in into what is a big topic to cover in 45 minutes or so. Cheers, Stephen. I agree, yes, and uh, you covered the topic very, very well. That's a really an insightful webinar. So thank you very much for all for taking part. And um, just a reminder that this webinar is recorded. It will be posted on our website 
uh, later on today, tomorrow morning. So if you want to revisit the website, you'll actually, as, as people who participated, you'll also get a, a link to, the, to that recording. So um, if you do want to revisit some of the stuff we've covered, please do also feel free to share that link. Um, with our uh, webinars and podcasts throughout this crisis, instead of putting behind a paywall, we've made them open access for, for, for everybody, recognising that, that you know, these are really big conversations that we need to be having in these, in these difficult and uncertain times. And also, please keep an eye um, on, our, on our forthcoming podcasts and webinars. Um, a lot of the subjects we've been talking about here, we do go into more detail on, on, on other webinars. And I think a lot of these issues, they definitely aren't going to go away over the, over the coming weeks and months. So a final thank you for me. Um, thank you to everybody for engaging. We can't give you a round of applause as if we were at a conference, so but we'll give you a virtual round of applause. Um, it, we should have been in Brighton this week, so we should all probably be recovering from, from hangovers if it was a normal world, but, but hopefully we'll start to get back to a, a new kind of normal a uh, bit later in the year. So. so thanks again to the panel. Contact details are up there. Um, hope to see you all again soon in one of our webinars and not too long before we see you all in person again. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the day, everybody. Thank you.